This presentation will be part two of 3 Nephi 12 through 16. We did chapters 12 and 13 in the last presentation, and so in this presentation we will focus on 3 Nephi 14 through 16 and see what some of the principles and doctrines that it teaches us and how to come unto Christ. So let's begin with 3 Nephi chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 1. He, Jesus, turned again to the multitude. We notice that Jesus now turns to the multitude, indicating that the message which follows is for all members of the church. Remember that this last part of 13, he turned to the 12, and most it was to the council to the 12, even though the principles apply to all of us. A lot of the council was to the 12 apostles, his 12 disciples. Chapter 14, verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. This verse has been misused and abused for generations. Often it is cited to indicate that one should not take a stand, should not acknowledge evil actions on the part of others, and so forth. It is almost inconceivable that one could derive from this passage the meaning that he or she should never label or identify deeds or actions as inappropriate, or that to report m such misdoings to the proper church or civil authorities is to place one in a position of judging his neighbor. This is simply incorrect. In point of fact, members of the church are required and expected to make numerous judgments each day. Definite discriminations which draw upon the discernment that comes from one's conscience through the light of Christ. When the Lord warned against judging, he was counseling his people against condemning someone for his sins, as well as against seeking to attribute motivation to a person when the observer cannot really know what is in the person's heart. Thus, making assumptions about someone would be unrighteous judgment. When Jesus encountered the woman taken in adultery, he did not deny the ugliness of her immoral actions, but he did not condemn her. He counseled her to go her way, repent, and sin no more, no doubt assuring her implicitly, if not verbally, that forgiveness and peace of soul would follow. The Joseph Smith translation once again comes to our rescue. Joseph Smith translation 7, 1 through 12 says, Judge not unrighteously that ye be not judged, but judge righteous judgment. That's how it originally read. The question is not whether the saints of God will make judgments. The question is whether their judgments are righteous, whether they are true and good. The more we seek to be like our Lord and Maker, who is the keeper of the gate, the one to whom the Father has committed all judgment, the more our judgments will be just. This is consistent with the following taught by Elder Dallin H. Oaks, quote, I have been puzzled that some scriptures command us not to judge, and others instruct us that we should judge, even to tell us how to do it. But as if I have studied these passages, I have been become convinced that these seemingly contradictory directions are consistent when we view them with the perspective of eternity. The key is to understand that there are two kinds of judging. Final judgments, which are forbidden to make, and intermediate judgments, which we are directed to make, upon, but upon righteous principles. First, a righteous judgment must, by definition, be intermediate. Second, a righteous judgment will be guided by the Spirit of the Lord, not by anger, revenge, jealousy, or self-interest. Third, to be righteous, an intermediate judgment must be within our stewardship. And then fourth, we should, if possible, refrain from judging until we have adequate knowledge of the facts. End of Dallin Elder Oaks's quote. So, we are to judge actions. I have the right to judge whether I want to associate with somebody, and if that association will drag me down to hell, then I have a right to judge that and not associate with that. But I do not have a right to condemn anyone or to make assumptions about them that I know nothing about. 
but I have a right to judge between righteousness and wickedness, even among people. That is righteous judgment, as long as it's done under the direction of the Spirit. We have to make judgments every day. You made a judgment when the person you decided to marry. What clothes you're going to wear, whether you're going to keep your covenants. So we have to make those intermediate judgments, but we are not entitled to make a final condemnation. That would be judging unrighteously. Chapter 14, verses 3 through 5. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Part of, an, part of condemning another... Con- Part of condemning another consists of highlighting or accentuating another's sins, parading or displaying them before the public when, in fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So often we are sickened by a sin in another, a sin of relatively small consequence, when, in fact, we ourselves are guilty of far greater offenses against God and man. A member of the church who condemns or pokes fun at another who wrestles with word of wisdom problems, for example, but who at the same time loses his temper or gossips or make a man an offender for a word, is deceiving himself. To draw upon the Savior's humorous analogy, there is in his eye a beam, a large timber which is used to support the roof of a building. He cannot see properly. Therefore, to remove the moat, the sliver, the tiny shaving of wood which he has discovered and identified in his neighbor's eye. So we get upset at the slightest little sin in somebody else why we have big moats, um, big beams in our eyes. We should say to ourselves, physician, heal thyself before you try to heal others. Chapter 14, verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Jesus is being neither unkind nor cruel in making making this request of his disciples. He is not calling non-members of the church dogs, nor is he identifying those who are ignorant of the gospel as swine. Just as one does not toss a very old set of scriptures or a dated copy of a patriarchal blessing into the backyard to be kept by the pets, so the saints should take care about how they present sacred things to others. Just as one does not drop a family heirloom or a diamond necklace into a pig pen, so the saints should use discretion in delivering the sacred doctrine of Christ to those who do not have the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Galilee, our Lord explained, Go ye into the world, saying unto all, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come nigh unto you. And the mysteries of the kingdom ye shall keep within yourselves, for it is not meet to give that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls into swine, lest they trample them under their feet. For the world cannot receive that which ye yourselves are not able to bear. Wherefore ye shall not give your pearls unto them, lest they turn again and rend you. That's the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 7, 9 through 11. In this final dispensation, the Savior has instructed, That which cometh from above is sacred, and must be spoken with care, and and by constraint of the Spirit. And in this there is no condemnation. So we need to be careful of the doctrines and truths that we share with people who are not baptized yet and are not familiar with maybe, say, some of the higher doctrines of the kingdom. Before those who are baptized, we need to keep it simple. Faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the ability to become gods, that there's a mother in heaven, that we have the ability to become like God. All of these should not be taught maybe readily right out of the gate, but need to wait until a person has a foundation in the basic doctrines of the gospel. Thus, we are to keep sacred things sacred, as counseled by Elder Bruce R. McConkie, quote, faith, repentance, and baptism are mysteries to the unbelieving Gentiles. But the mysteries of the kingdom of which Jesus here speaks are quite another thing. This phrase has a special meaning. 
It refers to the deep and hidden things of the gospel, to the calculus, as it were, which can only be comprehended after the student has become proficient in arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. It refers to the temple ordinances, to the gifts of the Spirit, to those things which can be known only by the power of the Holy Ghost. See, those things we need to keep sacred until someone has a foundation in the gospel. You don't try to explain the temple ordinances to someone who has not been baptized into the church and has a testimony of it. Chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Seeking personal revelation. There is nothing quite so natural as for a father to give understanding to a son or daughter who inquires sincerely. God desires that ultimately we know all he knows. He is not possessive of his knowledge. He seeks opportunities among his children to make known sacred things. God desires that we become as he is. He is not, he is not possessive of his status or of standing. He seeks opportunities among his children to endow them with power from on high. If any of you lack wisdom, James wrote, let him ask of God that gives to all men nobly and upbraideth, meaning reproaches or censors not, and it shall be given him. Nor is God's knowledge and power reserved for those called to lead the church. God has not revealed anything to Joseph, the Latter-day Seer explained, but what he will make known unto the twelve and even the least saints who may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. We have but to ask, at the same time bringing our lives into harmony with the truths we already know. God will reveal to us, line upon line, knowledge upon knowledge, those things that we are prepared to receive in our lives. He does not reveal things we are not ready to receive, because if he did, then it would condemn us. Because once he reveals something, brothers and sisters, then we are accountable for that knowledge. And so he waits until we are prepared. The qualification placed upon our prayers is simple. And whatsoever ye shall ask in the, my name, which is right, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be given you. Centuries later, Mormon repeated this teaching of the Saviors, this time with a slightly different emphasis. Whatsoever thing ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is good, in faith, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be done unto you. Ye ask, James directs us, and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Nephi likewise stated, I know that God will give liberally to him that asketh, yea, my God will give me if I ask not amiss. Therefore, I will lift up my voice unto thee. So when we, God will answer our prayers if we ask for those things which are right. Well, how do you know which things which are right or which are good? The only way that I know of is to have the Holy Ghost tell you what to pray for in your prayers. We are to seek to have the Holy Ghost tell us what to pray for. Then we would always ask for that which is right. Instead of asking for things maybe that we want in our lives, but maybe that God is, is not right that he gives them to us, that we think it's right, but if he blessed us with it, it would be to our condemnation. Elder Del G. Rumlin taught the following concerning perceiving personal revelation. Quote, the promise of personal revelation through the Holy Ghost is awe-inspiring, much like an airplane in flight. And like airplane pilots, we need to understand the framework within which the Holy Ghost functions to provide personal revelation. When we operate within the framework, the Holy Ghost can unleash astonishing insight, direction, and comfort. Outside of that framework, no matter our brilliance or talent, we can be deceived and crash and burn. The scriptures from the first elements of this form the first elements of this framework for personal revelation. Feasting upon the words of Christ are found in the scriptures stimulates personal revelation. Elder Robert D. Hell said, when we want to speak to God, we pray. When we want him to speak to us, we search the scriptures. The scriptures also teach us how to receive personal revelation. And we ask for that what is right and good and not for what is contrary to God's will. We do not ask amiss with improper motives to promote our own agenda or to fulfill our own pleasure. 
And above all, we are to ask Heavenly Father in the name of Christ, believing that we will receive. The second element of the framework is that we receive personal revelation only within our purview and not within the prerogative of others. In other words, we take off and land in our own appropriate runway. The importance of well-defined runways was learned early in the history of the Restoration. Hiram Page, one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon, claimed to be receiving revelations for the entire church. Several members were deceived and wrongly influenced. In response, the Lord revealed that no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant Joseph Smith, until I shall appoint another in his stead. And doctrine, commandments, and revelations for the church are the prerogative, per- prerogative of the living prophet. He receives them from the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the prophet's runway. Years ago, I received a phone call from an individual who had been arrested for trespassing. He told me it had been revealed to him that additional scripture was buried under the ground floor of a building he tried to enter. He claimed that once he obtained the additional scripture, he knew he would receive the gift of translation, bringing forth new scripture, and shape the doctrine and direction of the church. I told him that he was mistaken, and he implored me to pray about it. I told him I would not. He became verbally abusive and ended the phone call. I did not need to pray about this request for one simple but profound reason. Only the prophet receives revelation for the church. It would be contrary to the economy of God for others to receive such revelations, which belongs on the prophet's runway. Personal revelation rightly belongs to individuals. You can receive revelation, for example, about where to live, what career path to follow, or whom to marry. Church leaders may teach doctrine and share inspired counsel, but the responsibility for these decisions rests with you. That is your revelation to receive. That is your runway. A third element of the framework is that personal revelation will be in harmony with the commandments of God and the covenants which we have made with Him. Consider a prayer that goes something like this, Heavenly Father, church services are boring. May I worship Thee on the Sabbath in the mountains or on the beach. May I be excused from going to church and partaking of the sacrament, but still have the promised blessings of keeping the Sabbath day holy. In response to such a prayer, we can anticipate God's response. My child, I have already revealed my will regarding the Sabbath day. When we ask for revelation about something for which God has already given clear direction, we open ourselves up to misinterpreting our feelings and hearing what we want to hear. A man once told me about his struggles to stabilize his family's financial situation. He had the idea of embezzling funds as a solution, prayed about it, and felt he had received affirmative revelation to do so. I knew he had been deceived because he sought revelation contrary to a commandment of God. The prophet Joseph Smith warned, Nothing is a greater injury to the children of men than to become under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the Spirit of God. Some might point out that Nephi violated commandment when he slew Laban. However, this exception does not negate the rule. The rule that personal revelation will be in harmony with God's commandments. No simple explanation of this episode is completely satisfactory, but let me highlight some aspects. The episode did not begin with Nephi asking if he could slay Laban. It was not something he wanted to do. Killing Laban was not for Nephi's personal benefit but to provide scripture to a future nation and a covenant people. And Nephi was sure that it was revelation. In fact, in this case, it was a commandment from God. The fourth element of the framework is to recognize what God has already revealed to you personally while being open to further revelation from him. If God has answered a question and the circumstances have not changed, why would we expect an answer to be different? Joseph Smith stumbled into this problematic scenario in 1828. The first portion of the Book of Mormon had been translated when Martin Harris, a benefactor and early scribe, asked Joseph for permission to take the translated pages and show them to his wife. 
Unsure of what to do, Joseph prayed for guidance. The Lord told him not to let Martin Harris take the pages. Martin requested that Joseph ask God again, so Joseph did so. And the answer was, was not surprisingly, the same. But Martin Harris begged Joseph to ask a third time, and Joseph did so. This time God did not say no. Instead, it was as though God said, Joseph, you know how I feel about this, but you have your agency to choose. Feeling himself relieved of the constraint, Joseph decided to allow Martin to take the 160 manuscript pages and show them to a few family members. The translated pages were lost and never recovered. The Lord severely rebuked Joseph. Joseph learned, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught, Seek not to counsel the Lord, but to take counsel from his hand, for he counseleth in wisdom. Jacob cautioned that unfortunate things happen when we ask for things we should not. He foretold that the people in Jerusalem would seek for things they could not understand, look beyond the mark, and completely overlook the Savior of the world. They stumbled because they asked for things they would not and could not understand. If we have received personal revelation for our situation and the circumstances have not changed, God has already answered our question. For example, we sometimes ask repeatedly for assurance that we have been forgiven. If we have repented, been filled with joy and peace of conscience, and receive a remission of our sins, we do not need to ask again, but we can trust the answer God has already given. Even as we trust God's prior answers, we need to be open to further personal revelation. After all, few of life's destinations are reached via a nonstop flight. We should recognize that personal revelation may be received line upon line and precept upon precept. That revealed direction can be and frequently is incremental. End of quote. Chapter 14, verse 11. If ye then, being evil... This is a reference to a man's mortal and unsaved condition. If mortal man, man troubled on every side by temptation and trial, clouded in his vision by personal ambition and pride, is willing to provide for his own, how much more eager and able is God the Father, an exalted, immortal, saved being, one filled with mercy and love, to reveal himself and the truths pertaining to salvation to all who ask in faith. Chapter 14, verse 12, The Golden Rule. Our guide and standard for human conduct is summarized succinctly in this verse. It is a remarkable distill, distillation expression. It says so very much in so few words. This verse is the meaning of the command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus did not intend to suggest that each person strive to love himself. Nor did he mean to indicate that we should spend much time at all in trying to build our love for others. We ta he taught instead the ironic but inf infinitely true principle that only as we lose ourselves can we find ourselves. We gain the inner peace and stability of soul promised by the Savior only as we lose, our, lose ourselves in our quest for God and as we give ourselves selfishly in service to others. Thus the real meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself is love your neighbor as you would want him or her to love you. Treat others as you would want to be treated. Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Those who come into the true church leave the broad road and begin their journey to exaltation along a straight and narrow path. That path, the gospel path, must be navigated with care. That is to say, once a person enters through the gospel gate in turn style fashion, his life is indifferent. As time passes, he finds there are few and fewer things he can do in the world and still refrain, retain the influence and guidance of the Holy Spirit. At first, such seems restrictive, but in time he begins to feel and sense the liberating power which flows from Christ to him through the covenants and ordinances of the gospel. What at first may have been viewed as air, as an infringement, I'm sorry, that is a typo there.
as an infringement on his liberties is now seen to he is is seen to be sorry let's fix that seem to be the very key to personal freedom and peace. He has come to know the Lord, who is the truth, and the truth has made him free. In a modern revelation, we find an important commentary on these verses. In the revelation on marriage, recorded on the 12th of July, 1843, the Lord said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you abide my law, you cannot attain to that glory, Godhood. For straight is the gate, and narrow the way, that lead into the exaltation and continuation of the lives, that is, the continuation of the family unit, eternal posterity. And few there be that find it, because ye receive me not in the world, neither do ye know me. But if ye receive me in the world, then ye shall know me, and ye shall receive your exaltation, that where I am ye also shall, shall be also. This is eternal lives, to know the only wise and true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. I am he. Receive ye therefore my law. Broad is the gate, and wide the way that leads to death, that is, to the cessation of the family unit in eternity. And many there are that go in thereat, because they receive me not, neither do they abide in my law. Chapter 14, verse 14, If few there be that find it, the scriptures speak often of a straight gate and a narrow way, which leads into that life which we have come to know as eternal life. Stress is frequently placed upon the fact that few will ultimately get onto the path and navigate the course which will result in a saved condition hereafter. These are past scriptural passages. These are scriptural passages which must be viewed in proper perspective. In the long run, we must ever keep in mind that our God, the Father, is a successful parent, one who will save far more of his children than he will lose. If these words seem startling at first, let us read them for a moment. In comparison to the number of wicked souls at any given time, perhaps the numbers of faithful followers seem small. But ye must keep in mind how many of our spirit brothers and sisters, almost an infinite number, will be saved. What of the children who died before the age of accountability? Billions of little ones from the days of Adam to the time of the millennium. What of the billions of those who never had the opportunity to hear the gospel message of mortality, but who after receives the glad tidings, this because of a disposition which hungered, and thirsted after righteousness. This because of the disposition which hungered and thirsted after righteousness. And might we ask what of the innumerable hosts who qualified for exaltation from Enoch's city, from Melchizedek's Salem, or from the golden era of the Nephites? What of the countless billions of those children to be born during the great millennial era, during a time when disease and death have no sting, no victory over mankind? This is that time when the children grow up without sin and to salvation. Given the renewed and paradisiacal state of the earth, it may well be that more persons will live on the earth during the thousand years of the Lord's reign, Lord's reign, persons who are at least a terrestrial nature, than the combined total of all who have lived during the previous 6,000 years of the Lord's temporal continuance. Indeed, who can count the number of saved beings in eternity? Our God, who is triumphant in all battles against the force of evil, will surely be victorious in the numbers of his children who will be saved. So when we say, be few that be the, find the path that is straight and narrow, in perspective it will be billions upon billions upon billions. But compared to the total number of this earth world, it will seem few. Chapter 14, verses 15 through 20, Beware of False Prophets. Jesus here sets forth the preeminent test for prophets, the fruits. That is, we may judge and discern a prophet by what comes of the work he sets in motion. Does it bless lives? Is his doctrine sound, consistent, lifting, edifying, and expansive? Is the way of life of the religion clean and virtuous and stable? Does it produce citizens who stream the laws of who stream the laws of the land, lead upright lives, and mirror the message of their master, Jesus Christ. 
Does this prophet teach a gospel which requires the sacrifice of all things with the attendant promises that those who lay their all on the altar and continue labor in Christ-like fashion shall eventually inherit all that the Father has? Does the religion produce people who are holy, in whom dwell the spirit of the living God, and in whose midst the gifts and signs and wonders abound, those ancient miracles which have always attended the true church? Truly, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Ella Bruce Armacocky writes, A true prophet is one who has the testimony of Jesus, one who knows by personal revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and that he was to be or has been crucified for the sins of the world, one to whom God speaks and who recognizes the still small voice of the Spirit. A true prophet is one who holds the holy priesthood, who is a legal administrator, who has power and authority from God to represent him on earth. A true prophet is a teacher of righteousness to whom the truths of the gospel have been revealed and who presents them to his fellow men so they can become heirs of salvation in the highest heaven. A true prophet is a witness, a living witness, one who knows and one who testifies. Such a one is needed, is if, if need be, foretells the future and reveals to men what the Lord reveals to him. A false prophet is the opposite of all of this. End of quote. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, warned against those who teach or publish false doctrine, quote, Let us be aware of false prophets and false teachers, both men and women, who are self-appointed declarers of the doctrine of the church, and who seek to spread their false gospel and attract followers by sponsoring symposia, books, and journals, whose contents challenge fundamental doctrines of the church. Beware of those who speak and publish in opposition to God's true prophets and who actively proselyte others with reckless disregard for the eternal well-being of those whom they seduce. They set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. End of quote. Dot, uh, Third Nephi, chapter 14, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That these verses have reference to members of the church, Elder Bruce on McConkey writes, quote, For the day soon cometh that men shall come before me to judge me to, to judgment, to be judged according to their works. I am the judge, I am the Messiah, look unto me and live. I shall sit in judgment upon the world. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name do many wonderful works? To whom is he speaking? Is it not to those who have been baptized, those who have gained the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, those who have received the holy priesthood and have cast out devils and worked miracles? Two answers of equivalent meaning are recorded to this question. Both are answers that will be given to those saints who have not endured to the end, who have not kept the commandments, and who have not pressed forward with a steadfastness in Christ after baptism. In one, the account says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart ye from me, that ye work iniquity. In the other account, the words are, And then will I say, You never knew me. Depart ye, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you, and you never knew me. Your discipleship was limited. Your heart was not so centered in me as to cause you to endure to the end. And so for a time and for a season you were faithful. You even worked miracles, my name. But in the end it shall be as though I never knew you. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If ye believe that I am he of whom the prophets testified, if ye accept me as promised Messiah, if I am the Son of God and ye call me Lord, then keep my commandments, endure to the end, worship the Father in my name, and ye shall be saved. End of quote. That's who he's referring to when he says, not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, unto the kingdom of heaven. He's referring to those members who, yes, for a season, for a time, lived the gospel, did many mighty wonderful things, but were not faithful and did not endure to the end. Let's now go to 3 Nephi chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 2. Some among them who marveled and wondered what he would concerning the law of Moses. 
Mormon includes the historical context for the doctrinal teachings that follow. The Savior had already taught the Nephites that the law of Moses was fulfilled in him, and that the rites and sacrifices associated were to cease. The further elaboration on this teaching comes in this chapter as a result of the people's marveling and wondering concerning the meaning of the Lord's words. These Nephites and generations before them had known no other system of gospel living than the Mosaic Law. All of their worship, religious rites, and church organizations were built upon the law. In one marvelous moment, the resurrected lawgiver virtually changed their entire religious structure. Is it no wonder that it was difficult for them to comprehend that old things, the law of Moses, had passed away and all things become new? I'm sorry, that should be had and not bad. Chapter 15, verses 3 through 5. Marvel not, I say unto you, that the law is fulfilled. To ally their concerns about this new order of gospel teaching and practices, Jesus reiterated his identity as Jehovah, the lawgiver, as evidence of his authority to change their religious practice. He reminds them that the whole purpose of the law was to point to the infinite and eternal sacrifice which is now fulfilled in him. Three times in this verse he states that the law is fulfilled in him. Chapter 15 Verses 6 through 8, I do not destroy the prophets. Many of the Nephites, as they heard the Lord speak of the fulfillment of the law of Moses, must have wondered whether the words and teachings of the previous Nephite Lamanite prophets, as well as the old world prophets, whose teachings they had from the brass plates, were no longer relevant to them. In these verses, the Savior clearly states that the fulfillment of the law of Moses does not destroy the words of the previous prophets. There were yet many prophecies of these early prophets that were to, that were to be fulfilled, verse 8, and the Savior's ministry did not alter or destroy them. Jehovah made a covenant with Abraham anciently. Abraham was promised, one, eternal prosperity, two, a land that would eventually be the celestial kingdom, and three, God's priesthood power. These promises were also made to Abraham's descendants and will be fulfilled in the future. In addition, the principles that had been previously taught were still true, but the practices associated with the law were no longer needed. Covenants were not changed, but the manner in which they lived certain covenants was modified. In our own day, perhaps we, like the Nephites, wonder why and or misunderstand the reason for changes in church practices or organization. Elder Boyd K. Packer observed, There are those within the church who are disturbed when changes are made with which they disagree, or when changes they propose are not made. They point to these as evidence that the leaders are not inspired. Changes in organization or procedures are a testimony that revelation is ongoing. While doctrines remain fixed, the methods or procedures do not. End of quote. The underlying purpose or doctrine of the law of Moses was not being done away with. There was still the need to come unto Christ and partake of the atonement. The means or procedures by which men embraced the eternal gospel were all that were being changed. The covenant which I have made with my people is not all fulfilled. Verse 8, the Savior reminded them. The covenant he was referring to was the eternal gospel, the new and everlasting covenant, those unchanging principles of salvation. President Harold B. Lee stated, Keep in mind that the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ are divine. Nobody changes the principles and doctrines of the church except the Lord by revelation. But methods change as the inspired direction comes to those who preside at any given time. If you will analyze all that is being done and the changes that are taking place, you will realize that the fundamental doctrines of the church are not changing. The only changes are in the methods of teaching that doctrine to meet the circumstances of our time. You may be sure that your brethren who preside are praying most earnestly, and we do not move until we have the assurance, so far as lies within our power, that what we do has the seal of divine approval. End of quote. Jesus said that old things have passed away and that all things have become new. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve explained, 
It is crucial to understand that the law of Moses was overlaid upon and thereby included many basic parts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which had existed before it. It was never intended to be something apart or separate from, and certainly not something agnostic to the gospel of Jesus Christ, antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Its purpose was never to have been different from the higher law. Both were to bring people to Christ. Thus Jesus could say, For behold, the covenant which I have made with my people is not all fulfilled, but the law which was given unto Moses hath an end in me. The law of Moses taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not something added to the gospel. It just taught it through performances and ordinances of religious rituals and practices. That part had been done away because Christ had fulfilled all of that. And he changed now the procedures and the rituals in which were performed in the church. Such an example, the sacrament now will be instituted instead of the skilling of animals. Chapter 15, 9 through 10. I am the law and the light. Look unto me and endure to the end. The Savior is again testifying of his identity and authority in order that people will look to him and his teachings for salvation. Since he was the lawgiver to Moses, he commands the Nephites and us to hearken to the commandments and teachings that have been given to them in chapters 9 through 14. He reminds them that all the previous prophets, practices, laws, and ordinances had testified of him, Jehovah, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Christ. Previously they had been obedient to the law, but now Jesus commands them to be obedient to the lawgiver. I'm sorry, that should be B. To be obedient to the lawgiver. I have given unto you the commandments, therefore keep my commandments. The abundant life, eternal life, is available only to those who look to Christ in firm faith and submissive obedience. In that way, he is truly the life of the world. Without him, there is no eternal life to be obtained by anyone. He is the source to which we must steadfastly look if we are to truly live a life like with Christ, like Christ. Some may think of enduring to the end in terms of hanging on or putting up with or sticking it out. Such terms have little in common with the divine concept of enduring to the end. Exaltation is not bestowed upon those who can hang on the longest or put up with the most tribulation in life. It is a reward to those who have endured in faith, obedience, and continual vigilance, valiance amidst the storms of life and the fiery darts of the adversary. Patient endurance is to be distinguished from merely being acted upon, Elder Nehemiah Maxwell taught. Continuous quote, endurance is to be more than pacing up and down within the cell of our circumstance. It is not only acceptance of the things allotted to us, but to act for ourselves by magnifying what is allotted to us. True enduring represents not merely the passage of time, but the passage of the soul. End of quote. The endurance here spoken of by the Savior requires the continual keeping of the commandments, resisting temptations, repenting of our sins, exercising faith in Christ, rendering service, being prayerful, and loving God and our fellow men. Many scriptures in all of the standard works add words such as always or continually to the gospel requirements. Endurance that leads one to exaltation requires continual faith and faithfulness rather than sporadic spirituality and service. Fervency without frequency does not yield the same strength to endure to the end as does consistency, constancy and consistency in gospel living. Chapter 15, 11 through 15, he said unto those twelve. In the previous verses, the Savior has addressed the multitude and taught them generally. At this point, he directs his instructions to the twelve whom he has chosen to be a light and to the people. Just as Jesus is the light of the world, the perfect exemplar, he is admonishing the twelve to lead, serve, teach, and testify just as he would. As they follow him, they can then become lights unto the people, even as Jesus, even as Jesus is. Their words and deeds thus become his. With this backdrop, the Savior begins his doctrinal teachings to the twelve concerning the position of the Nephites and Lamanites in the house of Israel and his ministry to the other sheep. 
Chapter 15, verse 13. This is the land of your inheritance. Each of the twelve tribes of Israel was assigned an area of land for their inheritance in the land of Canaan. In addition to what they received in the Holy Land, the descendants of Joseph were also promised the land of Americas as part of their inheritance. The Savior told the twelve Nephite disciples that they and their people were a remnant of the house of Joseph. And this is the land of your inheritance. Verse 13. Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the land of their inheritance as follows, quote, Another name for America authorized by the Book of Mormon is the land of Joseph, referred to by the patriarch Jacob in blessing his twelve sons, and by the prophet Moses in his farewell benediction upon the twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob's allusion to Joseph as a fruitful bough by a well whose branches over, run over the wall was fulfilled in the migration of Lehi and his companions from Asia to America over the Pacific Ocean. It is hardly necessary to add that one of the main features of this western continent are those mighty mountain ranges, the Andes and the Rockies, well termed by the Hebrew patriarchs the everlasting hills, nature's depositories for the precious things of the earth, gold, silver, and other minerals, and for the precious things of heaven, the sacred record already discovered and others that are yet to come forth. End of quote. Chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. Neither at any time hath the Father given me commandment that I should tell unto them concerning the other tribes of the house of Israel. Jesus performed only the works and taught only the doctrines that his Father commanded him. In our record of his mortal ministry among the Jews, we have no mention of his teaching them concerning the remnants of the house of Israel that had been dispersed throughout the nations of the earth, including the Book of Mormon peoples. He was only allowed to speak fragmentarily of other sheep that must be gathered to one fold by he, one shepherd. Perhaps he wanted to teach them greater things, but was constrained by the Father. The reason that the Father did not command Jesus to teach more explicitly and extensively was the Jews' stiff-neckedness and unbelief, and because of their iniquity. It appears from this account that even if the Lord had taught more, they would not have understood it. This is a sobering warning. As far as we degenerate from God, the prophet Joseph Smith said, we descend to the devil and lose knowledge, and without knowledge... We cannot be saved. I'm sorry. That should be we. We cannot be saved. We learn from the example of Jews cited here by Jesus that the Lord stands ready to reveal to us great doctrines and additional scripture, but only as we seek such from the Lord, live righteously, and fully embrace that which has already been revealed. That's why we don't have the still portion of the Book of Mormon yet, because we have not completely and fully embraced the Book of Mormon as we should and use it in our personal lives and in our homes and in the church. Chapter 15, verse 17, One Shepherd. Christ is often called the Good Shepherd. The metaphor of the shepherd and his relationship to his sheep connotes personal care and concern. One modern commentary spoke of the personal care involved in the work of the shepherd. By day and night, the shepherd is always with his sheep. This, is, this was necessary on account of the exposed nature of the land and the presence of danger from wild animals and robbers. One of the most familiar and beautiful sights of the East is that the shepherd leading his sheep to the pasture. He depends upon the sheep to follow, and they in turn expect him never to leave them. As he is always with them and so deeply interested in them, the shepherd comes to know his sheep very intimately. One day a missionary, meeting the shepherd on one of the wildest parts of the Lebanon, asked him various questions about his sheep and, among others, if he counted them every night. On answering that he did not, he was asked how, how he knew if they were all there or not. His reply was, Mr. If you were to put a cloth over my eyes and bring me any sheep and only let me touch my hands on its face, I could tell in a moment if it was mine or not. That is how intimately the shepherd knows his sheep. That is how intimately Christ knows each one of us. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, speaking about this personal care, said, quote, Jesus is so personal in his shepherding and tutoring. 
Jesus knows and cares for each individual. He watches carefully over the seemingly smallest of things. End of quote. And what a great blessing that is. Chapter 12, 15, verse 23. I should not manifest myself unto them, save it were by the Holy Ghost. Neither the mortal nor the resurrected Christ manifest himself to the Gentiles to teach them, convert them, and gather them into his kingdom. It was Peter's vision in Acts 10 that opened the proselyting work among the Gentiles. It was Peter, Paul, and other disciples who took the gospel to the Gentiles. The reality of Christ's resurrection and the truthfulness of his gospel were not established among Gentiles by his ministering or appearance, but rather that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it would be through the gift of the Holy Ghost that the Gentiles would come to know the truth, not by the personal teaching of the Savior as he did to the Jews. We now go to our last chapter, 3 Nephi 16. So chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. I have other sheep which are not of this land, neither of the land of Jerusalem. In 721 B.C., the ten tri northern tribes of Israel were taken captive into Assyria. From there they were led into the lands of the north and were thereafter lost from the annals of history. They have thus come to be known as the Lost Ten Tribes. Much discussion and extended speculation have taken place as to their whereabouts and the manner in which they will return and be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance. It is common for Latter-day Saints, for example, to cite numerous legends or reminiscences of persons who supposedly heard Joseph Smith state that those Israelites are in the center of the earth, on a knob attached to the earth, on the North Star, or on another planet. We shall focus in our discussion on this subject upon what the Book of Mormon teaches on the matter, not what tradition teaches or rumors. In one of his concluding testimonies in the Book of Mormon, Mormon said, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you twelve tribes of Israel. If words mean what they say, and Mormon knew whereof he spoke, the twelve tribes of Israel were then scattered from one end of the earth to the other and but waiting for the message of the Book of Mormon that they might be gathered. When the ten tribes return among the sacred treasures they will have with them will be the Book of Mormon, because he wrote so eloquently on this subject, will we hear quote extensively from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. He states the following concerning the ten lost ten tribes. Quote, our friend Mormon, as he nears the end of his divinely appointed work, that of preserving the everlasting word as it was had among the Nephites, says, I write unto you Gentiles, and also unto the house of Israel, when the work shall commence, that ye shall be about to prepare to return to the land of your inheritance. Then, as though this situation was not sufficient, and least any should be confused as to the people to whom the Book of Mormon shall go, Mormon wrote, Yea, behold, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you the twelve tribes of Israel. The Book of Mormon is written to the twelve tribes of Israel, and this included the lost ten tribes. For that matter, the New Testament is addressed to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. You can see that in James 1, 1. And these things that the Spirit manifests in me, therefore I write unto you all, all the house of Israel, why? That ye may believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which shall have among you, and also that the Jews, the covenant people of the land, shall have other witnesses besides him whom they saw and heard, that Jesus whom they slew was the very Christ and the very God. And I would that I could persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That is to say, all Israel, the Lamanites, and the ten tribes included, shall be gathered if and when they believe the Book of Mormon. The ten tribes shall return after they accept the Book of Mormon. Then they shall come to Ephraim to receive their blessings, the blessings of the house of the Lord, the blessings that make them heirs of the covenant God made, made them heirs of the, of the covenant God made with their father Abraham. But say says one, are they not in a body somewhere in a land of the north? Answer, they are not. They are scattered in all nations. The north countries of their inhabitation are all the countries north of their Palestinian home, north of Assyria from whence they escaped, north of the prophets who attempted to describe their, inha their hab habitat. And for that matter, they shall also come from the south and the east, the west, and the ends of the earth. Such is the prophetic word.
Continuing Elder McConkie, but says another, did not Jesus visit them after his ministering among the Nephites? Answer, of course he did, in one or many places as suited his purposes. He assembled them together in exactly the same way he gathered the Nephites in the land bountiful, so that they could hear his voice and feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. Of this there can be no question. And we suppose that he also called twelve apostles and established his kingdom among them, even as he did in Jerusalem and in the Americas. Why should he deal any differently with one branch of Israel than with another? Query, what happened to the ten tribes after the visit of the Savior to them near the end of the thirty-fourth year following his birth? Answer, the same thing that happened to the Nephites. There was righteousness for a season, and then there was apostasy and wickedness. Be it remembered that darkness was destined to cover all the earth all of it, before the day of the restitution, and that the restored gospel was to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people upon the face of the earth, including the ten tribes of Israel. And finally, says yet another, will they not come with their prophets and seers? Answer, there is no other way they can or any people can be gathered. Of course they will be led by their prophets and prophets who are subject to and receive instructions from and the prophets who, lab who report their labors to the one man on earth who holds and exercises all the keys of the kingdom in their fullness. Did not Paul say that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets and that God is not the author of confusion? The Lord's house is a house of order. It has only one head at the time. Christ is not divided. In this day, when the head of the church can communicate with all men on earth, there is no longer any need for one kingdom in Jerusalem and another in Bountiful, and others in whatsoever places, place or places the ten tribes were when Jesus visited them. This is the promised day when there shall be one God, one shepherd, one prophet, one gospel, one church, one kingdom for all the earth. End of quote. So under the direction of our current prophet, will other prophets be called to gather out the twelve and ten tribes of Israel? And they will be taught by missionaries and those sent among them to teach them and come forth and be taught by, from the Book of Mormon. In speaking of the return of the lost tribes, a modern revelation attests, He, Christ, shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north countries, and the islands shall become one land, and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place, and the earth shall be like it was in the days before it was divided. And now we know the millennial setting for this gathering, and the Lord, even the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people, and he shall reign over all flesh. And they who are in the north country shall come come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves. As to the prophets among the ten tribes in our day, Elder McConkie has written, quote, Their prophets are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They are state presidents and bishops and quorum presidents who are appointed to guide and direct the destinies of their stakes and wards and quorums. That is the ten tribes shall be gathered into the fold in the same way as all others. Missionaries shall teach them out, shall search them out, and shall hear the message of the restoration through the Book of Mormon, shall be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and shall thereafter locate themselves in the quorums and wards and stakes where the saints congregate. We frequently hear that when the ten tribes return, they will bring their scriptures with them. This idea, though not found specifically in scripture, is generally inferred from Nephi's prophecy, which says, And it shall come to pass that the Jews shall have the words of the Nephites, and the Nephites have the words of the Jews, and the Nephites and the Jews shall have the words of the lost tribes of Israel, and the lost tribes of Israel shall have the words of the Nephites and the Jews. Will they not bring their scriptures with them? Elder McConkie asked. Probably not, at least there is no such promise. Yes, we and they will have their scriptures, and those scriptures will tell the visit of the risen Lord among their forebears. How they will be brought to light is not known. It may be in much the same way the Book of Mormon was revealed to the Word. And once again, it will be by or under the direction of the president of the present church, for he holds the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom of the things that are sealed and hidden up. End of Elmer McConkie's quote. In summary, to those who argue that the ten tribes are presently together in one large body, 
totally organized and empowered as members of the church, we might consider the following. One, it is an established doctrine of the church, when easily sustained by each of the standard works, that there was a universal apostasy after the mortal ministry of Christ. That such an abrasive prophecy embraces the ten tribes is evident from the allegory of Zenos. So eventually, even among the ten lost ten tribes that were once together, they eventually apostatized. There was a total universal apostasy upon the earth, and they were scattered throughout the nations of the earth. Number two, it is an equally well-established doctrine that in the last days there should be a universal restoration of the gospel. That is, the gospel restored to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith is the gospel that is destined to go to those of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. There is no justification to suppose that every nation, kindred, tongue, and people does not include the ten tribes. Indeed, if the ten tribes were together in a body in 1830 with their prophets, why the necessity of Joseph Smith and the return of the host of ancient prophets with their keys and authority to him? Surely, if all these things were already on the earth, the Lord would not, would not ignore them and start from scratch with some other people. Number three, the keys of the gathering of Israel and the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north, a phrase which seems to mean more generally among their scattered condition, were given to the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Keys are the right of presidency, the directing power. They, simple, they imply responsibility. How could the prophet claim to preside over people and an event unknown to him? This would be akin to calling a man to preside over some foreign mission, but A, refuse to tell him where the mission was located, or B, allow him any contact with the people. According to the analogy, all he would be afforded would be an invitation to the mission reunion. Truly, it shall not be given to any one to go forth to preach my gospel or build my shirt church except he be ordained by someone who has authority and it be known to the church that he has authority and has been regularly ordained by the heads of the church chapter 14 16 verse 4 the fullness of the gentiles in the days of jesus and his apostles the gospel went first to the jews and then under the direction of peter and paul to the gentiles in this final dispensation the gospel was restored restored through the gentiles in a Gentile nation, and will eventually go primarily to Israel, Lamanites, and the Jews. The era in which the gospel goes to the nation of the Gentiles is called the, full, the times of the Gentiles. The era when we shall see shortly the Gentile nation sin against the gospel and refuse its powers and blessings is known as the fullness of the Gentiles. This is not a single moment. It will instead be a period of time. To some degree, we are today in a period of trans transition. The gospel is going forth to Gentile nations, but at the same time, wickedness is increasing and more of the children of men are sinning against the light of the gospel. Chapter 16, verses 4 through 13, Who are the Gentiles? The majority of references in the Book of Mormon to the word Gentile are references to anyone who is not a Jew. A Jew was anyone who was a descendant of Judah and anyone from the land of Jerusalem, like the children of Lehi. President Joseph Finley Smith explained that by this definition, many Gentiles did have the blood of Israel. In this dispensation of the fullness of times, the gospel came first to the Gentiles and then is to go to the Jews. However, the Gentiles who receive the gospel are in the greater part Gentiles who have the blood of Israel in their veins. The reason why members of the church today in the Book of Mormon were called Gentiles is because we lived in America, a Gentile nation. We didn't come from the land of Jerusalem. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described this as well. Quote, we have heretofore identified the Jews as both the nation of the kingdom of Judah and as their lineal descendants, all this without reference to tribal affiliation. And we have said, within the usage of terms, that all other people are Gentiles, included the lost and scattered remnants of the kingdom of Israel, in whose veins the precious blood of him whose name was Israel does in fact flow. 
Thus Joseph Smith of the tribe of Ephraim, the chief and foremost tribe of Israel itself, was the Gentile by whose hand the Book of Mormon came forth. And the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints who have the Gospel and who are of Israel by blood descendants are the Gentiles who carry salvation to the Lamanites and the Jews. See, there's explained. That's why we are called Gentiles, the Book of Mormon, because we live, we come from a Gentile nation, even though we are of the house of Israel. Chapter 16, verse 5, the covenant which the Father hath made unto the house of Israel. We know that it was Jehovah, who is Christ himself, that made the covenant with Israel. All that he did, however, was done under the direction of the Father. The Father sent his prophets, they represented him, and they spoke his word. When Jesus quoted the Old Testament prophets to the Nephites, he attributed their words to the Father. Though the revelations came from the Son, yet in the ultimate sense, the truths were those of the Father. Chapter 16, verses 10 through 15. At that day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel. This is a sober warning, a warning directed fairly specifically to the Gentiles in America, including the members of the church. At that point in time, when pride, deceit, hypocrisy, priestcraft, whoredom, secret abominations, and murders proliferate in America, and to some degree even among Latter-day Saints, then the Lord's judgments will be poured upon the land. That the saints will be involved in the admonition, abominations of the land is frankly evident in the Savior's careful, careful uses of language. He states that if the Gentiles will repent and return unto me, said the Father, behold, they shall be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. One cannot return to a place where he has not been. This seems to be a reference to a return to the faith. In addition, the Master warns that those who sin against the light shall be as the salt that has lost its savor. Verse 15. A modern revelation specific, specifies clearly that it is only those who have received the covenant gospel who can become the salt of the earth. Perhaps that is what the Lord meant when he spoke through Joseph Smith in 1837. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation, and as a whirlwind, as it were, as it shall come upon the face of the earth, saith the Lord, and upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasted against me in the midst of mine house saith the Lord. God will have a humble people, President Benson warned. Either we can choose to be humble or we can be compelled to be humble. So these verses in Third Nephi where he's talking about when the Gentiles return, if they will repent and return, is talking about members of the church that have left the church and if they will come back and return back into the fold. Chapter 16, verse 15, I will suffer my people, O house of Israel, that they shall go through among them and shall tread them down. This is a theme, a reoccurring theme in the Savior's teachings to the American Hebrews, and one to which Mormon later refers. There has been much discussion concerning its meaning. Many Latter-day Saints conclude that it refers to a type of Lamanite upraising, a rebellion by Lamanites identified in this interpretation as a remnant of Jacob against the Gentiles in America. We, those who are writing this commentary, have chosen to take another approach to these passages. It is interesting that in 3 Nephi 21, the master quotes a prophecy from Micah 5, 8 through 14, an oracle which uses language similar to that above. According to this account, the rendering of the Gentiles, this metaphor of a lion among the sheep takes place in the day when such things as witchcraft, soothsayers, idolatry, more immor immorality, priestcraft, lying and deceits are all destroyed and done away. See 3rd When will such things be done away? Clearly after the Lord comes and the millennial day has begun. It would seem that the image of the remnant of Israel rendering its Gentiles enemy, enemies is symbolic of Israel's ultimate victory over its foes, a victory which comes when the Savior returns and the wicked are destroyed. 
quote, except for a few who are the humble followers of Christ, the Gentiles will not repent. They will revel in their abominations and sin against the restored gospel, and they shall be burned by the brightness of our Lord's coming, while the righteous, here called the remnant of Jacob, shall abide the day. And then, in the prophetic imagery, it will be as though the remnants of Israel overthrew their enemies as a young lion among the flocks of sheep. End of quote. So thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped with some of the doctrines or principles in these chapters. If it did, please hit the like button.